Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and uh, call the committee to order. Welcome everybody to the Senate uh, Committee on Growth and Infrastructure. Uh, I trust that everyone is uh, well familiar with the rules of the committee uh, at this point, but I'll just uh, remind everyone to be courteous uh, and respectful even when you disagree with someone's position. Uh, if somebody's on Zoom, I don't think we have anybody today, but if you happen to be on Zoom, don't forget to keep yourself muted until uh, we call on you to speak. With that, I think we can go ahead uh, and open up our first hearing of the day for SB 430, which revises provisions governing the Nevada State Infrastructure Bank. Uh, and I will, oh, call the roll. Thank you. Senator Brooks. Senator Hammond. Here. Senator Pickard. Here. Senator Spearman. Chair Harris. Here, thank you so much. Uh, and please mark Vice Chair Brooks and uh, Senator Spearman present as they arrive. All right, take two. We'll go ahead and open up the hearing on SB 430. Uh, and I believe I'll welcome our esteemed governor to the table. Welcome to the Senate and uh, the Senate Committee on Growth on Infrastructure in particular. Happy to have you. Uh, please go ahead and begin when you are ready, sir. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. It's nice to see you all in person in the legislative building. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. I am Nevada Governor Steve Sislak, and I sincerely appreciate this opportunity to be before you. Uh, thank you to the members of the committee and Chair Harris and the Committee on Growth and Infrastructure. For the record, I am Governor Steve Sislak, and I'm incredibly proud to be here today to present Senate Bill 430. Broadly speaking, Senate Bill 430 is being proposed to launch and expand Nevada State Infrastructure Bank so we can fast track much needed infrastructure projects across the state and create thousands of good paying jobs. As I highlighted in my State of the State address earlier this year, investing in infrastructure helps to create real jobs for real Nevadans. This proposed legislation, along with a $75 million appropriation in my recommended budget, will help Nevada create a robust pipeline of critical infrastructure projects, allowing us to put hundreds of millions of dollars into our economy and help get people back to work. Capital projects not only create high paying construction and development jobs now, but those infrastructure improvements serve as the building blocks for our state's economic expansion for decades to come. The concept of the state infrastructure bank was approved by the legislature in 2017 but the bank has not been funded or initiated. It has yet to move any projects or create a single job. This bill will be the first step towards changing that by ensuring that our infrastructure bank has the necessary tools that can help the state, local governments, and tribal nations get projects off the ground immediately. Launching the state's infrastructure bank will play a major role in helping to immediately create pathways for good paying jobs in Nevada while helping to build projects for communities who need it. We know that our state needs better roads, better schools, more affordable housing, and more sustainable forms of energy. Senate Bill 430 will help in making all of these projects a reality while improving quality of life for all Nevadans. At the same time, these changes will allow the state to best maximize federal dollars dedicated to infrastructure projects within President Biden's American Rescue Plan and the proposed American Jobs Plan. This bill will, will enable us to fast track billions of dollars of infrastructure projects that haven't been started. The faster we move these projects from the list of things that we need to do to the list of the things that we are doing, the more Nevadans we will put to work. This bill has been made possible thanks to the continued support provided by trusted state and community leaders that we know that this is an effective and productive way to move our state forward together. These leaders include Treasurer Zach Conine, Rob Benner, Secretary Treasurer of the Building and Construction Trades Council of Northern Nevada, along with many other leaders from Nevada's labor community. Mary Beth Seawald, President and CEO of the Vegas Chamber. Elizabeth Fielder, President of NAOP Northern Nevada. And David Strickland, President of NAOP Southern Nevada. Overall, the proposed legislative changes coupled with the funding for the State Infrastructure Bank 
could allow Nevada to launch up to $200 million in new infrastructure projects by the end of 2021 and $1 billion in new infrastructure investments over the next five years. This proposal is anticipated to create 16,000 construction jobs by the end of 2021. And by 2031, the passage of this bill could create up to 30,000 good paying jobs for Nevadans. I would like to conclude by highlighting that we are all aware the state of Nevada has undergone trying times through this pandemic. SB 430 is the first step toward delivering a promise to the people of Nevada to build back a better Nevada. I look forward to working with the legislature on this investment in our state's economic recovery and future prosperity. I thank the committee for its consideration of this proposal. I will now turn it over to Treasurer Zach Conine and the other representatives here today to present my state infrastructure bill, SB 430. Thank you, Senator Harris, Chair. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, committee. Always a pleasure to see you. you. Treasurer Conine, welcome to the gauntlet. Thank you, Governor, Chair Harris, and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Zach Conine, and I have the pleasure of serving as Nevada State Treasurer. Before I begin, let me take a moment to thank the governor and his team for their focus on putting Nevadans back to work. First, we were focused on keeping Nevadans safe, and now we're focused on putting them back to work. This is a jobs bill. This is one of the largest jobs bills in the history of Nevada. Each word and definition is a step towards high-paying, middle-class building, family supporting jobs. But let's go back to the beginning. In 2017, the legislature came together and worked across the aisle to pass Assembly Bill 399 unanimously. This bipartisan bill established the framework for the State Infrastructure Bank to leverage capital from outside Nevada to kickstart priority transportation and utility infrastructure projects. The bill was passed in a time when it looked like federal government was going to move a large federal infrastructure package forward and the state needed a mechanism to centralize and vet priority projects to meet our infrastructure needs. Unfortunately, that federal money never came in until now. That infrastructure week never happened until now. Since the 2017 legislative session, Nevada's infrastructure needs have continued to rise, and now more than ever, we need to do everything we can to revitalize our communities. Leading up to the pandemic, our office spent a lot of time looking at ways we could potentially fund the infrastructure bank using outside sources of capital. We researched best practices from other states and countries. We also talked to leading experts in the field to learn more about what Nevada could be doing to create meaningful investments in infrastructure. Once the economic effects of the pandemic began to take hold, launching the infrastructure bank became not just a good idea, but an economic necessity to ensure we could invest money directly into communities while creating good paying jobs in the building and construction trades. Leading up to the governor's State of the State address in January of 2021, the Treasurer's Office began working collaboratively with numerous other agencies to figure out how we could best improve upon the existing framework of the State Infrastructure Bank to get projects off the ground quickly and effectively. Through those conversations, we determined that the bank's focus purely on transportation and utility infrastructure was somewhat limited as it came to attracting capital and putting people back to work. As such, we started looking at ways we could expand the bank's focus to prioritize additional types of infrastructure projects so we could put more people to work more quickly and put much needed investment into the communities that have been traditionally left behind. Broadly speaking, Senate Bill 430 seeks to ensure that we have the tools we need to start tackling our state's infrastructure needs immediately. And Chair, with your permission, I'll walk through the bill. Would committee members like a walkthrough of each provision? All right, yes, please. Thank you. Happy to do it. Sections two through seven of the bill are definitional sections, which help to further define the various types of infrastructure projects which are referenced throughout the bill. Section 10 expands the type of infrastructure projects which can be financed by the bank to include transportation facilities, utility infrastructure, water and wastewater infrastructure, recycling and sustainability infrastructure, digital infrastructure, social infrastructure, and other infrastructure related to economic development. I don't get paid by the infrastructure, but I'd like to. Section 12 of the bill expands the definition of a qualified borrower to include local governments, tribal governments, or private entities which are created solely for charitable or educational purposes. Section 15 expands the board of directors to include the director of the governor's office of energy. 
Additionally, Section 15 clarifies that the Infrastructure Bank's budget account will be held under the Nevada Department of Transportation. However, the bank will operate and be governed under, under the direction of a separate Board of Governors. Section 15 of, or 16 excuse me, of the bill provides the board with the flexibility to establish various accounts and sub-accounts for the operation of the bank, but ensures that all accounting is done in accordance with all applicable federal laws. And Section 19 allows any division of the Department of Transportation, the Department of Business and Industry, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the State Treasurer's Office, the Governor's Office of Energy, or any other governmental unit to may, to the extent that money is available, provide technical advice, support, and, the, and assistance to the bank. Finally, Section 20 of the bill ensures that the bank can become operational beginning on July 1, 2021. This will ensure that we can not only work to get a pipeline of projects ready in anticipation of funding from the American Rescue Plan and the American Jobs Plan, but we can also make sure our economic recovery is as strong as possible. The remaining sections of the bill make technical and conforming changes to the statute. Uh, before we move to questions, I, I'd just like to quote President Biden very quickly, and let me make sure I get this right. Jobs, jobs, jobs. With that, Chair, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. All right, thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions? Senator Pickard. Hey, Madam uh, Chair, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, good to see you, uh, Treasurer Conine. Um, uh, just a couple of questions as I went through this. Um, uh, first, uh, is the $75 million appropriation uh, going to, is that intended to come from the ARP or the American Recovery Program or plan or whatever it's called um, or, or from another source or general fund or another source? Treasurer Conan, for the record, thank you for the question, Senator. The $75 million proposed in the governor's budget is actually a general obligation bond uh, that we'll be issuing through the Treasury. We were able to sharpen our pencils going into this session. We have an extremely high credit rating at the state, and through that, we were able to generate $100 million of additional bonding capacity compared to the last biennium, even during the middle of the pandemic. And we thought it was important to use those funds, uh, and the governor thought it was important to use those funds towards job creation activities. Okay, and then as I looked at uh, section... Uh, six, no, section seven, sub one, brackish or seawater desalin desalinization projects. I'm not aware of any seashores that uh, we'd be pulling seawater from. Why are we authorizing that kind of work? Treasurer Conan, for the record, we're not aware of any seashores either. Um, all of the definitions you'll see are intended to be as broad as humanly possible. So if there was an opportunity to get involved in a project that made sense from a job creation or for some other economic reason, we'd be able to, uh, but we don't know of any seawater either. All right. So am I to presume from that answer that we're looking for jobs anywhere in the United States or jobs in Nevada? Treasurer Conan, for the record, jobs in Nevada, but I think we've seen that Nevada has done historically a really good job of exporting some of our water technologies, and so we want to make sure that if there's a technology to export, that we take advantage of it. Okay, got it. Okay, and then uh, as I was looking at uh, Section 10, um, I noticed recycling was there. Or what kind of recycling are we talking about? Recycling generally, so plastics and whatnot uh, that are uh, uh, taken in by our our uh, uh, waste services people or something else? Treasurer Conan, for the record, again, thank you for the question. Again, our, our intention here was to have the broadest language possible. So instead of identifying one specific recycling project, when we asked for state and uh, for local and municipal governments to give us ideas for projects, there were all sorts of projects. And we wanted to make sure that uh, whichever direction the bank chooses to go through the board and that public rubric, that we had the flexibility to do that. All right, and, and the reason I'm asking these uh, questions as to the specifics is because, uh, you know, there are two parts that, uh, as I was doing some research, not for this bill, it was actually for the, the resolution where we want Congress to estab establish a national infrastructure bank. I was doing a little research into infrastructure banks generally, and the consensus in the media, you know, those that were reporting on the various things across the country, was that the uh, National Infrastructure Bank kind of made sense, but less so the state infrastructure banks because they were typically undercapitalized uh, and uh, operated um, uh, by uh, um, offices that didn't fully understand the banking system. Now, I know you come from a uh, financial uh, background, so uh, I will exclude you. I think you're perfectly competent here. 
but uh, uh, in your uh, successor's jobs, I don't know that they will be necessarily. And so uh, what they pointed to was a, a pretty serious history of failed state infrastructure banks. So what are we doing differently to avoid that? Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record, and first Senator, let me thank you, because perfectly competent is always a target of mine. The uh, secondly, secondly, bro broadly on the Office of the Treasurer, I would hope that any Treasurer has an experience with banking history, because that is deeply the job. But thirdly, when we looked at state infrastructure banks, both successful and unsuccessful, nationally, internationally, we came up with a couple of very specific things that the bank needs to have. One is flexibility the ability to move into projects as the market dictates. And not just the market, but investors who could be coming in to outside the state who want to invest in state infrastructure, but might only be able to do it for a specific kind of project. We also knew it was important to get a wide group of stakeholders at the table, which is why you've got folks from the Governor's Office of Economic Development, folks from business and industry, individuals who have uh, experience and offices who have experience with the capital stacking that becomes necessary for a state infrastructure bank. And that lets us get back to sort of broadly why a bank makes sense. And one of those things is a centralization of planning functions from an economic infrastructure perspective. This is hard work. You've got new market tax credits and opportunity zones. You've got the availability of EB-5 and six schema funding. You've got all of these different financial opportunities, and they're all difficult. And in Nevada, oftentimes we fall at the bottom of federal infrastructure spending when it comes to discretionary spending because we are not prepared to do the work. The bank lets us do the work. We think it's deeply important for that reason. All right, thank you. Uh, but speak, if you would, please, uh, to the capitalization level. Uh, because as I was doing the research, they suggested we are talking about numbers that should be in the hundreds of millions or billions to properly capitalize an effective infrastructure bank, and yet we're coming in at 75 million. So uh, my guess is, or uh, my assumption going in was, this is probably just seed money, get it started, you know, give it some minimal amount, start to uh, uh, accumulate funds from whatever sources, and then it would operate. So can you go through what the steps would be or should be to get to the point where it's a functioning bank and not subject to the same kind of of uh, undercapitalization and collapse that uh, the other states have seen? Treasurer Conan, for the record, I think that's a great question because we have seen over the last year businesses that were undercapitalized had a harder go of it than businesses that were overcapitalized. And that's generally what we see in small businesses and large businesses and government functions uh, across the board. And Nevada has been undercapitalizing things for a long time. Right. Uh, in a separate bill, uh, the governor, working with Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno, has proposed some changes to the grants office. I know this is work that you're very familiar with that will help us bring in more than a billion dollars eventually of federal funding every year. We know that there's funding coming in from ARP. And when we look back at ARA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, um, after the last Great Recession, we didn't do as well as we could have done because we didn't have the tools together. So from a capitalization perspective, you're right. The $75 million is seed capital. But on top of that, we'll be able to layer any funds that have to go into the state from ARP that are specifically for infrastructure and need to go through an infrastructure bank, any funds from the American Jobs Plan that need to go through an infrastructure bank, and any additional capital we're able to go get. Because there are billions of dollars in capital in pension funds and investment companies that are looking for a return higher than the yield they're able to get in the treasury agency market and lower than the risk associated in the stock market. We think, based on all of our conversations and talking to these funds, that there's an opportunity for that money to come to Nevada. This is the tool that helps us get it. All right, thank you for that. And, and uh, just by way of comment, um, as I said, it sounds like, it, at, at least in the reading that I've done, uh, most people think infrastructure banks, if properly capitalized and, and run, uh, can be good for the state. Um, uh, I just, I'm alarmed at the small number, uh, given all that I read about the mistakes that the other states have made was that initial investment was uh, well underneath the point at making it, that it would allow it to be successful. Um, and so if we're not taking a big chunk of that ARP money to uh, adequately fund it, um, I'm afraid we're just uh, throwing money down the drain as the other states whose infrastructure banks collapsed did as well. And 
Treasurer, or sorry, Chair, do you mind if I... Happy to put that in the form of a question if you want to respond. <laughs> Please, thank you. Yes, would you like to respond to that? I would, thank you. Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record, you're right. We need to make sure we capitalize this bank appropriately. $75 million will not fix all the infrastructure needs in our state. $750 million wouldn't fix all the infrastructure needs in our state. But we have an opportunity to start the work that should continue for generations. We have the opportunity to start that work now so that whoever follows behind us will be in a better place than they are now, right? And in 2017, a great idea uh, was started and then left in a binder. And I think it's, it's really, really necessary, especially now, especially coming off the pandemic, especially with the opportunities in front of us from a federal capitalization perspective, to take that binder off the shelf and put people to work. That's what we're focused on. But you are absolutely right. If you undercapitalize this thing, it will fail. Uh, we don't believe $75 million is undercapitalization from a seed capital perspective. But if that's all it ever gets, then yeah, we're going to have trouble. Senator Hammond. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Treasurer. Uh, so, yeah, I was part of that group in 2017. Uh, this is uh, really a, an idea that was birthed from uh, the Southern Nevada Forum uh, where we looked at the infrastructure needs. Uh, so many times that we probably could have taken advantage of uh, opportunities to grow in Southern Nevada, Northern Nevada, had we had something like this in place. We left a lot of things blank in 2017, including the board, the makeup of the board, I believe. Uh, we had some structure there, but not everything. So um, this is, but some of it looks a little different uh, in what you're proposing here. So not, not exactly familiar. Uh, the idea was to uh, create infrastructure where there was no structure at all, uh, to create something that uh, wasn't provided already by a private industry. And so, you know, looking forward, I, I just want to make sure uh, I get on the record that you're, we really are proposing here um, infrastructure that doesn't exist, that not, is not going to be competing with uh, private infrastructure or private uh, business in that area. We're not creating a, a competition between the government and, and private industry. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, we, we, you know, that's, that's something we never contemplated. We really wanted to see something new so that others could come in and then enjoy the structure that was created and then business grow from that. Um, and of course, the diversification of our economy coming as a result of that as well. So if you could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Treasurer Conan for the record. And, and thanks for asking that question. I think the focus of the infrastructure bank is on helping underserved and unserved communities. And in that space, we will, of course, first focus towards areas where there is no service. That is the focus of the bank. How can we put people back to work? How can we fix problems that no one else is fixing? Functionally, the business of the state infrastructure bank is not in to be competition with private businesses. It's to work with and leverage private businesses in order to provide services to Nevadans and jobs for Nevadans, right? And so absolutely, the focus of the bank is not about replacing a service that already exists in a private business. Thank you. Senator Spearman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I don't know whether this is a question or a comment, maybe a little bit of both. Um, so one of the things that, that intrigued me when I read the bill is that it, it, it's not going to be competing. It's something new. There's something called the new energy economy. And many of the underserved communities that you spoke of are not participating in that, not, not from the level of, of entrepreneurship. Is there is there anything, and maybe, maybe I missed it, but is there anything that speaks to how we make sure that underserved communities um, are being uh, reached out to so that in this uh, new energy economy, make sure that there is some parity? Treasurer Conan, for the record, th thank you for that question. And I think it, that goes back to something that Senator Pickard was mentioning, which is what do good banks do and what do bad banks do, right? The banks that, that are successful reach out to the community and provide the services that the community needs. The banks that are successful, like any reasonable uh, participant in a market, are looking for areas that are underserved, are looking for areas where the return is possible, are looking for areas where they can solve a problem that cannot be better solved by another function. That is the purpose of the bank. And as we develop the bylaws, as the board, right, of which I'm a member, but only one voice, uh, as the board develops the bylaws through which we'll evaluate projects, the rubric, if you will, that we'll be going through to determine allocations of capital, I think it makes total sense for that to be one of the things that we're looking at, not just how many jobs we're creating 
and uh, and and is, as it relates to how much money we're spending, not just the risk of the project, not just the potential rewards, but whether or not we are dealing with these systemic issues. And I'll point towards um, the guidance that was released today by the federal government, all 151 pages of it, on the American Rescue Plan, spoke specifically towards fixing problems um, that had been exasperated, but also existed prior to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. All of these things have to work together. If any parts of government are existing in a silo, we will not be successful. Thank you, Anne. Um, I, I asked that basically because I've been looking at the Gwen Center's uh, report, and it's those communities that have been hardest hit, not just from a health standpoint, but from a wealth standpoint or lack thereof. And <clears throat> one of the things that they recommend is to make sure that we're looking at policies that look at not just now, but also the long term and have to look at it from the standpoint of how do we bring everybody along at the same time. So. Treasurer Conan, for the record, I've read that report. The Gwynn Center does fantastic work. And I think the governor said it best last week. Spending is easy. Investing is hard. We're here to do the hard work. The bank will do the hard work. Are there any additional questions from members? All right, not seeing any. I will go ahead and move on to testimony, if that's okay with you, Treasurer Conine. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Treasurer Conine, for the record. Thank you. Is there anyone uh, in the audience who'd like to testify in support of SB 430? Will Adler, for the record, representing the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. Pyramid Lake would like to thank uh, the governor and uh, the Treasurer Conine for the presentation and the inclusion of tribal nations in uh, the availability for applicants for the infrastructure bank and what that could do for tribal nations around the state. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to testify in support in person? All right, not seeing anyone. Uh, is there anyone on the Zoom who'd like to testify in support to SB 430? All right, no one is virtually jumping up and down. BPS, go ahead and uh, see if there's anyone on the phone line who'd like to testify in support, please. Thank you, Chair Harris. Callers, if you'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 430, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Will the caller with the last three digits of 020 please slowly state and spell your name for the record? You may begin. Once again, caller with the last three digits of 020, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. My apologies. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Beth Sewald, spelled S-E-W-A-L-D. I'm the president and CEO of the Vegas Chamber. The Vegas Chamber applauds Governor Sislak for his commitment and foresight to fund Nevada's infrastructure bank with the introduction of Senate Bill 430. I would also like to thank State Treasurer Zach Conine for his support as well. The Chamber supported the original legislation that created the State Infrastructure Bank in 2017 and now endorses the proposed allocation of $75 million for the fund. The Chamber has a long legacy of supporting infrastructure investment projects in our state because of the positive economic benefits associated with these types of projects. We believe that by investing in the infrastructure bank uh, and making it a strategic priority of the state, Nevada can better plan for the future and build the infrastructure necessary to diversify the economy and create jobs, jobs, jobs. This is type, the type of legislation that will help stimulate the economy and attract economic development throughout Nevada, foster career opportunities, and help put even more Nevadans back to work. State infrastructure banks are the type of innovative and pragmatic fiscal policy that we need to embrace as it allows for greater flexibility for financing infrastructure investments. Infrastructure banks also allow states to better leverage traditional federal uh, aid, highway, and transit grants. 
This will benefit Nevada's taxpayers as we work to also increase our share of federal grants dollars and to increase the economic impact of each dollar we put back into our economy. This investment by the state is a crucial step as we work together to rebuild and reinvent Nevada's economy together. We urge this committee to support this important piece of legislation and pass SB 430. Thank you so much. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 216 please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Thank you, Chair and committee members. This is Brian Reeder, B-R-I-A-N-R-E-E-D-E-R, -E 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 speaking on behalf of the Nevada Contractors Association. NCA represents general and subcontractors and businesses affiliated with the commercial construction industry throughout Southern Nevada. Um, we would just like to thank the governor and commend the great work of Treasurer Conine for bringing this bill and we urge your support. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 500 please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee, John Leleu, L-E-L-E-U, here testifying in support of the B430 on behalf of NAOP. As one of the original proponents of uh, AB 399 in 2017, NAOP worked very, very hard uh, alongside the RTC, um, Senator Hammond, Green Bustamante Adams, um, in, in getting the State Infrastructure Bank formed and passed. Um, we worked tirelessly since to get that infrastructure bank funded, and we would like to credit Governor Sisolak, Treasurer Conine, on finding a very creative solution to getting this bank up and running and funded. We stand in uh, strong support of SB 430, and we urge your support as well. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 718 please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Thank you, Chair Harris and Vice Chair Brooks for allowing my statement of support. My name is Wesley Harper and I am the Executive Director of the Nevada League of Cities and Municipalities, W-E-S-L-E-Y-H-A-R-P-E-R. -E -E the League is in support of SB 430 and we appreciate the work of the Governor's Office and the bill sponsors to bring this bill forward. And we appreciate the distinguished members of the Senate Growth and Infrastructure Committee for hearing it. The Nevada State Infrastructure Bank has the capability of being an important partner to local governments by providing capital and financial assistance that can advance transportation projects and facilities, utility infrastructure, and with this measure, critical infrastructure needs in water, wastewater, renewables, recycling, sustainability, as well as digital and social improvement infrastructure and economic development. This builds a thoughtful expansion of the scope and breadth of the bank's capacity and authority, and we sincerely ask the committee's endorsement. Again, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for your attention and for allowing my statement of support. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 155 please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Thank you, Chair Harris and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy Cabrera, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-C-A-B-R-E-R-A, -E -E and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for the Nevada Conservation League here in support of SB 430. SB 430 will allow the infrastructure bank to be used for water and waste, wastewater infrastructure, renewable energy, recycling, and sustainability infrastructure. Nevada produces virtually no fossil fuels, but is rich in clean energy potential. Focusing on homegrown renewable energy will keep Nevada's money invested in our state and grow our clean energy economy. SB 430 will allow our state to make investments in infrastructure to reduce pollution, address environmental injustice, and prepare for the, for the threats of climate change, all while building an economy that puts every community back to work. We'd like to thank Governor Sisolak and Treasurer Conine for bringing this bill forward, and we urge the committee support. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 069 please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. 
Good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the Growth and Infrastructure Committee. My name is Kanani Espinoza, K-A-N-A-N-I-E-S-P-I-N-O-Z-A, with the Roe Law Group representing the American Council of Engineering Companies. ACEC represents Nevada's design and engineering community. We are speaking in support of Senate Bill 430 and would like to thank Governor Sisolak and Treasurer Conine for prioritizing infrastructure. Activating the Nevada Infrastructure Bank will add another important mechanism for the funding of critical infrastructure projects in our state. We encourage your support and thank you for your time today. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 266 please state and spell your name for the record? You may begin. Thank you, Chair Harris and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nate Bluin. That's B-L-O-U-I-N. And I work as the policy manager for the InterWest Energy Alliance. InterWest is a regional trade association representing the nation's leading developers and manufacturers of renewable energy resources in Nevada and across the West. I'm here today in support of SB 430 and the economic development benefits this bill will have at such a critical point in Nevada's recovery from the pandemic. SB 430 will allow federal economic recovery funding to flow towards shovel-ready renewable energy projects and transmission that will allow Nevada to meet state energy and climate goals on schedule. Adding renewable energy and associated infrastructure to the purview of the infrastructure bank and providing substantial funding to incentivize these projects to start construction soon will provide additional revenues to state and local governments while enabling thousands of new jobs. Transmission projects that are vital to opening up new solar, wind, and geothermal development will benefit from SB 430's passage. And uh, as a representative of the renewable energy industry, I would urge you to support this bill today. Thank you. Will the caller with the last three digits of 746 please state and spell your name for the record? You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Harris, Vice Chair Brooks, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Devlin Doneshru. That's D-E-V-L-I-N-D-A-N-E-S-H-F-O-R-O-U-Z on behalf of NB Energy. We come to your committee today in support of SB 430, which aims to revise provisions governing the Nevada State Infrastructure Bank it has been a difficult year for Nevadans. And while we are beginning to see some light at the end of the tunnel, there's still plenty of work that needs to be done. SB 430 would play a pivotal role in Nevada's economic recovery. As outlined by the governor in his state of the state address, a well-funded state infrastructure bank will allow Nevadans, Nevada to leverage outside capital to fund important infrastructure projects and create jobs that are desperately needed today. The governor's office of economic development has already identified at least 162 potential shovel-ready projects across the state that could be funded by such infrastructure bank. Simply put, infrastructure projects means thousands of good-paying jobs for Nevada. And the energy is in the business of building the infrastructure that powers our state's economy. Financing that infrastructure is a different story for us due to the support we receive from our parent company. But other infrastructure projects sometimes not go forward due to lack of financing. A well-functioning state infrastructure board can be immensely influential in assisting those areas that need help to break ground. And the energy supports additional investments in infrastructure, and that is why we are here today supporting SB 430. We have spoken to State Treasurer Zach Conine regarding a couple of definitions we'd like to clarify, and he has been terrific to work with. With legislative deadlines approaching, we wanted to make sure we got on the record supporting SB 430, and we'll follow up with the Treasurer. We thank you for your time today and have a wonderful day. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 377 please state and spell your name for the record? You may begin. 
Chair Harris and members of the committee, my name is Jaina Moan, J-A-I-N-A-M-O-A-N, and I'm the External Affairs Director of the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. Thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 430. We appreciate Governor Sisolak for this effort to expand the facilities and projects that can receive loans and other financial assistance from the Infrastructure Bank. We think this provides an opportunity for incorporating nature-based solutions in Nevada's infrastructure plan. The 2020 Nevada Climate Strategy highlighted the importance of considering how existing and planned infrastructure will withstand conditions of increasing heat, drought, and extreme weather. Fortunately, nature is a smart solution to help meet Nevada's infrastructure needs. And in this context, I'd like to share a few examples. Natural infrastructure can be used for floodplain restoration and enhancement, reducing risks of flood and improving water quality. An example of this can be seen along the Truckee River, where the Conservancy has restored natural river meanders and riparian vegetation. This work has helped to ensure that the Tahoe-Reno Industrial Center has a clean water supply and has mitigated flood risks that would have otherwise generated costly road repairs, property loss, or human injury. Similarly, wildlife crossings are nature-based solutions that provide safe passage for migrating wildlife while preventing accidents. And at the community development level, nature-based solutions include permeable pavement, vegetated swalls, and green streets. These activities also create jobs. We think that incorporating nature-based solutions into infrastructure facilities and projects will help position Nevada to receive federal infrastructure dollars. For example, the Federal Emergency Management Agency recently published a guide to nature-based solutions in conjunction with the request for proposals for the Building Resilient Infrastructure and in Communities grants. We thank the Governor's Office for bringing the bill forward. SB 430 is a necessary positive step to advancing Nevada's future with projects that support clean water, clean energy, healthy communities, and nature. We urge your support of SB 430. Thank you for hearing our testimony. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 725 please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, this is Andrew McKay, A-N-D-R-E-W-M-A-C-K-A-Y. I'm the Executive Director of the Nevada Franchise Auto Dealers Association. Uh, not to take too much of your time, obviously, we echo uh, all of the sentiments of the uh, previous speakers. Um, however, we truly believe that infrastructure is a quality of life issue. And one of the keys of quality of life are jobs. And obviously, this accomplishes two of those uh, factors. Um, we want to go on the record and thank Governor Sisolak as well as Treasurer Conine for bringing this important p uh, piece of legislation forward. Uh, we encourage and respectfully request the committee's support um, of the bill. Thank you for your time. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 520 also please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Chair Harris, members of the Committee on Growth and Infrastructure, Anthony Ruiz, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-R-U-I-Z with Nevada State College. Nevada State College is in full support of SB 430. We'd like to thank Governor Sisolak and Treasurer Conine for bringing this forward and their vision and their foresight. We support the broadening of the types of infrastructure project this bill permits, as well as the job creation and development that Adams can certainly expect from its passage, and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 292 please state and spell your name for the record? You may begin. Good afternoon, Rob Benner, R-O-B-E-E-N-N-E-R, -E -E with the Northern Nevada Building Trades. We believe this bill would help create good paying union jobs that are a pathway to the middle class as we recover from this pandemic. It's critical that we invest in our infrastructure and make sure that we're creating good paying jobs for Nevada's workers. This proposal would create tens of thousands of jobs for Nevada's workers over the next 10 years. This is a long-term investment in Nevada's future. We thank Governor Sisolak and Treasurer Conine for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 398 please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. 
afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the Senate Committee on Growth and Infrastructure. My name is Sabra Newby, S-A-B-R-A-N-E-W-B-Y, and I am representing the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, in support of SB 430. We'd like to thank Governor Sisolak and Treasurer Conine for bringing forward this important piece of legislation, and especially for the broadening of the definition of infrastructure. We are truly in a transformative moment for our state where we have both the power and the opportunity to change Nevada's trajectory towards more research, more innovation, and more prosperity. UNLV stands ready to assist in the recovery of Nevada through applied research and innovation and preparing future students for the jobs and economy of the future. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 023 please state and spell your name for the record? You may begin. Hello, and thank you, Committee Chairwoman Harris and committee members. My name is Dr. Brenda Pearson, and I'm here representing the Clark County Education Association, B-R-E-N-D-A-P-E-A-R-S-O-N. In 2020, CCA commissioned an economic evaluation by the Anderson Economic Group to determine ways to invest in existing industries to diversify our economy. In the report, it was found that Nevada created the State Infrastructure Bank in 2017 but failed to fund it. Today, CCEA is in support of the changes to the bank provided by SB 430. Nevada remains in the minority of states without a functioning infrastructure bank. Without one, we are potentially missing out on federal transportation opportunities and utility infrastructure. CCEA believes the language in SB 430 will provide much needed support for the bank to get it off the ground to work towards an economically diverse Nevada. For reference, we have submitted the Anderson Economic Group's report an executive summary as an exhibit. CCA thanks the Office of the Governor for bringing this bill forward and eagerly await further supporting the economic diversification and development of Nevada that includes a direct workforce pipeline from the K-20 education delivery system. Thank you. Will the caller with the last three digits of 899 please state and spell your name for the record? You may begin. Good afternoon, committee. This is Christine Hess, B-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, Hess, H-E-S-S, -S, with the Nevada Housing Coalition. We respectfully submit our support of SB 430 and would like to thank the governor and treasurer for their leadership as we uh, recognize that affordable housing is infrastructure. As this committee is aware, we have an extreme shortage of affordable housing in Nevada, and we need to make sure that we are positioned and poised to access all available tools available for affordable housing production as we work to alleviate this deficit. Thank you very much. If there are any additional callers who would like to provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 430, please press star 9 now to enter the queue. Chair Harris, at this time, there are no additional callers wishing to give testimony in support. Thank you so much, BPS. Uh, is there anyone in the room who would like to testify in opposition to SB 430? Okay, not seeing any. Anyone on the Zoom? Also not seeing anyone. Uh, BPS, if you could see if there's anyone on the phone who'd like to testify in opposition to SB 430. Certainly, Chair. Callers, if you would like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 430, please press star 9 now to enter the queue. Once again, that is star nine now to enter the queue for testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 430. Chair Harris, at this time, no callers have indicated that they would like to give testimony in opposition to the bill. 
Okay. Uh, is there anyone in the room who'd like to testify in the neutral position? Okay. Anyone on the Zoom? All right. Let's see if there's anyone on the phone who'd like to testify in the neutral position on SB 430. Thank you, Chair. Callers, if you would like to provide neutral testimony for SB 430, please press star 9 now to enter the queue. Chair Harris, at this time, no callers have indicated that they would like to provide neutral testimony. All right, with that, I'll invite you back up, uh, Treasurer Co. 9, um, for some closing remarks. But before you do, I think we have uh, a couple of additional questions for you. Um, I will start. Uh, I know that there's been some discussion out there about using uh, or forcing uh, PERS to use their investment fund to uh, fund this bank? Is it your intention to use any of those funds to get this bank up and started? Treasurer Conine, for the record, it's absolutely not our intention to use any PERS funds to get the bank up and started. PERS does their own investments and does, frankly, quite a good job at it. With any source of outside capital, whether it's PERS or a pension fund or something else, we're going to do what attracts outside capital to all banks. We're going to do a good job. We're going to tell people the work that the bank is going to do, then we're going to do it. We're going to provide clear metrics, clear goals, and a clear understanding of what that capital will be used for. I hope we attract PERS money. I hope we attract everybody's money. Nevada needs it. Senator Spearman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I made reference to um, an article when I talked to you in the Gwynn Center. It's the Gwynn Center, their report on the impact of COVID on communities of color, specifically pages 11 to 12. Uh, where it talks about how hard communities of colors have been, been hit. But I also wanted to ask, um, and I'm, <laughs> I'm acutely aware of it as I struggle to re recover from COVID on the differently abled community. Um, there is one article that says there, the differently abled community suffers um, probably about 26 times more than their able-bodied um, counterparts. Are there any provisions for those who are differently able to share in what is going to happen, the infrastructure uh, creation or recreation or whatever for uh, the infrastructure bank. Treasurer Conan, for the record, and, and thanks for asking that question. You know, our office runs ABLE accounts, which are achieving a better life experience, uh, an account that allows individuals who are differently able to save for and, and create their own future, right, to, to create a better life for themselves um, and their families. And we've been very proud of that work. And one of the things that that showed us as we, as we go around the state is that there are parts of our state that are less accessible for everyone, whether it's sidewalks and crosswalks in Battle Mountain or in downtown Las Vegas, the historic west side, whether it's uh, schools in White Pine County. I mean, there, there are opportunities for us to fix these long-term systemic issues. And one of the reasons that we haven't is money. And so if we're able to attract the sort of capital that we expect we'll be able to attract, if we're able to better use and better leverage the capital that we know we're going to have, we're going to be able to solve some of those problems. And I think that's, that's the point of the bank, right, is to invest in areas where we haven't invested as we should have in the past, to fix some of these long-term blights on uh, our success as a government. We can do this. Thank you for the question. I really do. Thank you. And uh, I, I recognize that. I just needed to get on the record there. There's some communities that historically are usually overlooked or an afterthought. So. All right. Any last questions while we have the treasurer here? Okay. Seeing none, uh, Treasurer Conan, if you'd like to make any closing remarks. Hey, treasurer Conan, for the record, Chair, uh, thank you so much, committee, for taking the time to hear this bill. Uh, a year ago, we were confused and then we were scared and then when we start seeing the economy start to recover for some but not all we were hopeful uh, i would say that this bank represents our determined side this bank represents our willingness and our dedication to do the hard work that is going to take to build the nevada we deserve we hope to get your support on this bill and those other efforts and we really appreciate the time and the questions thanks for having me all right thank you with that we will close the hearing on sb 430 have a great day uh, and I'll open up the hearing on AB 154, which revises provisions governing certain notice 
provided by Public Utilities. Welcome, Assemblyman Roberts. Uh, go ahead and begin when you are ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I am Assemblyman Tom Roberts, Assembly District 13 in Southern Nevada. I'm here to present AB 154. With me today is Christine Bailey from NV Energy. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit why this bill came to fruition and what the idea is behind it. And then with your permission, I will call Ms. Bailey up uh, to go over the uh, technical aspects of the bill, and then we'll turn it back over to you for questions. So how this bill came forward is uh, Judy Stokey is a constituent of mine uh, in District 13. Uh, she obviously has worked for NB Energy for a long time. We were discussing uh, a problem with NB Energy is that current statutes require that all uh, communication regarding rate increases or rate adjustments is done in writing by mail. Uh, they uh, currently have quite a few members uh, that are customers that actually opt for all electronic. What this bill allows you to do is that if you opt to receive your communications in that manner, then you would be able to uh, receive any of those notifications via the, the uh, venue that you choose being electronic. They would no longer have to mail these things to your home. Uh, the second aspect came up as an amendment in, in the hearing is that they also have, are required to put uh, those notices on a specific colored paper that actually adds to the cost of mail. Uh, so we put in the bill to, to remove that requirement. However, there still would be uh, ample uh, printing to, to basically bring notice to those bills or, or to those uh, paperwork in case you did choose to receive your uh, correspondence uh, by mail instead of electronically. That's pretty much the, the gist of it. Um, just those two changes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Christine Bailey, uh, who will go over the technical aspects of the bill. Ms. Bailey, welcome. Uh, go ahead and have a seat. Spell your name for the record. Begin when you're ready. Good morning, Chair Harris, Vice Chair Brooks, members of the committee. I thought I was getting out of the spelling bee part. Uh, my name is Christina Bailey Shaver on behalf of NV Energy, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A. B-A-I-L-E-Y-S-H-A-V-E-R. Uh, the Assemblyman has gone over most of the highlights of the bill. Um, just wanted to go through the other points. Um, existing statutes and regulations impose different requirements on the format and manner of notice that NV Energy must provide to its customers. Examples are in writing and different colors of paper. It's been more than 15 years since this language was put into place, and we now have many more robust um, ways to communicate with our customers. While thousands of NB, NB Energy customers have requested to receive communications and notices via electronic notice, the current statutes and regulations do not expressly permit NB Energy to do this. AB 154 makes it clear that NB Energy can provide all communications required by statute via electronic notice to customers who have requested that they receive the communications electronically. If you have, are still getting your paper bills, you will still get your notices on paper. That's the important part. By providing these notices electronically, NV Energy will be eliminating administrative burdens and furthering customers' desire to go paperless. Not notably, 40% of our customers, or about 545,000, have requested paperless billing. For customers who continue to desire mailed paper notices, they will continue to receive those notices. AB 154 also requires or removes cumbersome printing requirements, which, sorry about that, um, <laughs> which require the use of standalone fluorescent paper. While the intent of the language to use fluorescent paper was, cer was certainly to provide clear notice, the advancement of printing technology has made it so that we can create a much more clear and engaging notice for customers if we simply utilize the regular size printing paper with easy to read graphics and images to support the required notice language. Using regular size paper will also be more efficient and will save money. Any savings will be passed directly back to our customers. In addition, NV Energy also utilizes its website, social media, the PU PUCN website and other means of communi communication to communicate rate adjustments. These additional methods of communication provide customers with ample opportunities to see and hear about rate adjustments. Happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one. Um, uh, when I noticed the uh, fluorescent paper requirement uh, and we're uh, getting rid of that, um, my thought was, well, it was probably put in statute because people were missing it. And so we wanted some way of making sure we got their attention. 
how do we do that if, uh, um, if, if there was a problem before? Well, let me phrase it this way. How do we avoid recreating the problem it was intended to fix? Um, Christina Bailey, for the record, Senator Pickard. I will say that 15 years ago, our bills looked very different, so they were much more monotone. Um, with our, our, our bills today that come out in paper, they're going to be on white paper. There are boxes that we put messaging on that definitely are a larger font. Sometimes they'll have a picture. They're, they're very eye-grabbing, so it, it's not what it used to be when, when this was put in, where you kind of needed that extra attention piece. This is something that's very clearly marked. So uh, uh, I understand your answer then to mean we'll do other things to replace it, make it stand out. This isn't going to uh, uh, allow NV Energy or anyone to hide that information because I can imagine uh, not that NV Energy or any current uh, um, utility would do this, but and I can sure see them saying, oh, let's avoid a firestorm and let's just bury this someplace and then be able to say, oh, we made the, uh, the uh, notice. You know, I, I, it makes me a little nervous. Christina Bailey, for the record, Senator Pickard, um, there is no intention of putting it into a small font or trying to tuck it into the bill. It, um, I'd be happy to provide you with a, an example of what that text box, look, box looks like, and it's definitely clearly labeled. And we're also putting it any time that we have any type of rate adjustment or changes to our service, we are very active with our social media department as well. So it's getting that message out. It's really important to our customers, so it makes it important to us. Sure. I appreciate that. I get the bills. I look at them. So I know that graphic arts uh, department uh, within NV Energy has grown. Um, uh, they've done a good job. I mean, it's a, a, a better looking bill. But at the end of the day, I, 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 because we're not putting in a requirement that it be, you know, obvious that it uh, stand out, it looks different from the rest. You know, there are lots of things we could say beyond just, you know, uh, allowing it to be printed on the white paper. Um, uh, so it's just, I was just kind of trying to travel down that logical path uh, and to make sure that we're not authorizing, you know, the ability to bury that information in a way that people would miss it. So technically they got noticed, but they didn't read it. Thank you. Senator Spearman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hi there. I didn't recognize you with the mask on. <laughs> um, so there's going to be a cost savings um, for this past. What has there been any discussion as to what happens with the cost saving? Or maybe you said it and I just didn't hear it. Christina Bailey, for the record, um, spent Senator Spearman, any cost savings will be passed back to our customers. Um, so the, I guess the thing that I would say, is because sometimes the cost savings goes um, unrecognized or a nice way of saying it, ignored. So do you all have um, any plans to show what this cost savings would be? I, 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 for one, hate to get a whole bunch of paper. So, you know, and the, and the amount that you could save is going to be in direct proportion to. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because some, sometimes Envy Energy doesn't get a good rap on rate increases. So is there any plan to say, okay, this is, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. So the people who aren't paying attention to this, to this hearing can know why we why you why you did it and why they're going to save money. Christina Bailey, for the record, Senator Spearman, um, I know that I, I'm not certain what the amount of the cost savings would be, but I'm certain that with the passage of this bill, that that is something that we would definitely share with our customers to let them know that not only the benefits of going paperless beyond just not having another piece of mail in your mailbox, um, which I'm a big fan of. But also the, the administrative costs, that they do add up, and having the extra colored paper and an extra insert and things like that, I'm not sure that they would be a substantial amount of money, but we'll definitely be able to share that with you. And I, I would like to say on the record that we've been very proud of having lower rates in the last 10 years. So we haven't had any rate increases. We're very proud of that. Any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on to testimony. 
uh, I'm going to uh, assume there is no one in the room who'd like to testify uh, in support since we just have our bill sponsor with us and the sergeant at arms. Although you're welcome to. Okay. Uh, is there anyone on the Zoom who'd like to testify in support? Not seeing anyone, BPS, if you could please uh, open it up to those on the phone if they'd like to testify in support of AB 154. Thank you, Chair Harris. Callers, if you'd like to testify in support of AB 154, please press star 9 now to enter the queue. Will the caller with the last three digits of 080 please press star 6 to unmute yourself? And then please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. For the record, this is Susan Fisher, S-U-S-A-N-F-I-S-H-E-R, with McDonald Carano calling in on behalf of CERT Energy. CERT is a geothermal company that serves a little over 105 homes in the Reno area with geothermal heat. It's embedded within MB Energy service territory, so they still receive their electricity from MB Energy, but any heat resources they receive from CERC Energy. Um, AB 184 is a no-brainer. We support it wholeheartedly. We actually do email bills to our um, our clients in that service territory, customers. And in addition, if we're going to know that we have a planned outage or if there's any work going on on their systems, we communicate with them via text. Personally, I would prefer to get all my bills via email and not get anything on paper anymore because most of that just gets torn in half and put right into the trash or into the recycling bin. So we appreciate your hearing this bill and appreciate the sponsor for bringing it. Thank you. Chair Harris, at this time, the public line is open and working. However, we have no callers at all. Okay. Um, by at all, I'm assuming that you're telling me it's futile to go through both neutral and uh, opposition testimony. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, yes. Thank you, Chair Harris. We have no callers. All right, let the record reflect that there are no callers then in the neutral uh, or the opposition um, uh, position. And I'll invite you back up, Assemblyman Roberts, if you'd like to make any uh, closing comments. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, you, your attention and hearing the bill today, and I would urge uh, passing, and uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. With that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB 154, and we will open up the hearing on AB 188 and welcome Assemblywoman uh, Brown May to the dais. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. It is a great pleasure to be here in front of you again this session. Uh, thanks for taking the time to hear Assembly Bill 188. I am also joined on the Zoom by Sean Sever, who is our legislative liaison with the Department of Motor Vehicles, and Ms. April Sanborn may also be joining us. <clears throat> So, um, I, uh, for the record, my name is Tracy Brown May. I am the Assemblywoman representing Assembly District 42 uh, in Central Las Vegas, and I am pleased to be here to present Assembly Bill 188 for your consideration. For those of you familiar with the Commission on Special License Plates during the interim, you may recognize this bill as one of five recommendations that came out of that commission as a result of the meetings that were held throughout the interim. So there was a lot of work that went into the crafting of this bill. And what it does essentially is it returns the responsibility of special license plates to the Department of Motor Vehicles while retaining an auditing provision in the Legislative Council Bureau. Some background information, as many of you may know, the state of Nevada permitted the use of special license plates beginning back in 1977 and Assembly Bill 358 of the 2003 legislative session expanded the creation of special license plates for different organizations 
and it created the Commission on Special License Plates. The Commission has met every interim uh, since its membership, since it was created, and its membership consists of five legislators and three members representing the Departments of Motor Vehicle, the Department of Tourism and Cultural Affairs, and the Department of Public Safety. The responsibility of the Commission on Special License Plates is to approve or disprove applications for the design, preparation, and issuance of special license plates that are submitted to the Department of Motor Vehicles. The application process is according to the process that's described in Chapter 482 of the Nevada Revised Statutes and the corresponding regulations. Additionally, uh, the Commission has met to make certain determinations relating to charitable organizations that receive fees from special license plates to notify charitable organizations that have failed to comply with certain requirements and to take additional action when organizations have not taken corrective action following notification from the commission. And if you have followed the Commission on Special License Plates, you know that there was an instance when a nonprofit organization was not in compliance that the commission had to deal with. So special license plates have remained a resourceful way for charitable organizations to raise additional dollars through the creation of a special license plate. Uh, and, and they have to go through a number of technological uh, programming preparations through the Department of Motor Vehicles in order to comply and um, be deemed a safe plate. Now, nothing in Assembly Bill 188 is intended to disrupt the existing system or alter the ability of organizations to apply for special license plates. And there are no new requirements regarding how special license plates are issued. There are also no revisions to the standard for applications. All of that remains the same. Uh, special license plates and the entities requesting a special plate will continue to have the same requirements under existing law and regulation and will continue to be processed chronologically by the department. This measure retains the existing application process for charitable organizations and it requires the Department of Motor Vehicles to hold public meetings to review, approve, or disprove the applications that are received. The department may also notice or take action against charitable organizations that do not meet certain program requirements. The measure abolishes the commission on special license plates due to its redundancy. That's really what the meat of this bill is, to eliminate redundant government um, by giving back the responsibility of special license plates to the Department of Motor Vehicles. And it is as a result of the number of years that have been spent by the legislative body to craft a good and solid system to make sure that there are parameters in place for the issuance uh, and governance of special license plates. Now, prior to becoming a member of this assembly body, I had the good fortune of representing a nonprofit organization that applied for a special license plate. I can tell you that the process is onerous. It requires several levels, and uh, it took five years for the organization to even receive a, a, the ability to present in front of the Legislative Commission on Special License Plates. So there were a number of uh, prior expectations that needed to be fulfilled. Now, as stated, this bill recommends that the commission be abolished in an effort to streamline and reduce redundancy. However, the legislative auditor will retain the existing requirement to examine the financial re records of each of the nonprofit organizations receiving special license plate fees and will provide an annual report to the legislature. Through the diligent uh, efforts of various members of the commission over the past 18 years, Nevada has a wonderful and refined process for the application review and approval of special license plates. And we just want to make sure that we give the opportunity back to the DMV. They hold public hearings so that people are aware of what the process is um, to seek approval for a special license plate and that the auditing comes back to the legislative body. And with that, uh, we are happy to take questions. Uh, Mr. Sever is available on Zoom. If you'd like to walk through the technical parts of the bill, we're happy to do that. I believe we have, uh, I think we're ready for questions. Senator Hammond. Uh, really no question. I don't think I need to talk to Sean Sever. I just say uh, you had me at abolishes the Commission on Special <laughs> License Plates. Thank you very much. Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't disagree uh, with Senator Hammond uh, on his face, but uh, one question that came to mind was we created this only in 2003 for a reason. Uh, I don't know what that reason was, but our, uh, just like the last bill, uh, um, I asked the question, are we recreating a problem we had before that the commission fixed or, or you know, uh, because I assume that uh, since we were given out license plates before we created the, the commission, 
um, there was a problem. So how do we avoid getting into the same problem we had before? Thank you for the record, Tracy Brown, May Assembly District 42. Through you, Chair, to the Senator. Uh, I would say that the problem did not exist before the Commission on Special License Plates was created. And what the Commission on Special License Plates was able to do was take an application out of order as opposed to a chronological order of application. I can only say that because the organization that I worked with prior to this session um, waited for a very long time. And that was not uncommon. There were times that applicants for special license plates were able to seek priority for other reasons instead of the chronological order of consideration for application. By eliminating this, we also we eliminate the redundancy in government, but we also add fairness back into the process so that everyone who applies would go through the DMV's chronological application process. Well, I appreciate that because I didn't know what the problem was before. Uh, it doesn't sound, it sounds like you're saying there wasn't a problem. We just created it uh, just to create it to be able to allow people to, to take cuts in line, um, which doesn't seem to me to be a legitimate reason to create a whole commission. But anyway, uh, Mr. Sever, maybe uh, um, uh, since you were probably there at the time this was created, um, maybe you could enlighten me, but uh, I, I don't need a, a whole history lesson. But I sure would like to know why we created this, this commission in the first place and, and uh, how we avoid cre recreating a problem. Uh, yes, Chair and Committee Members, Sean Sever from the DMV. Um, uh, I was not here at the DMV when it was created, so we'll have to do some research on that. But uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we are okay with absorbing, absorbing the duties of the commission uh, we have found a lot of them to be duplicative of what we're already doing, and we we have submitted a no impact fiscal note uh, that says we will absorb the cost. But I can I can get back to you on that, Senator. All right, thank you. Uh, and yeah, it, it, eliminating duplication I think is probably worthy in and of itself. Uh, but I am curious. Thank you very much. Thanks, Madam Chair. Any additional questions? Not seeing any, we'll go ahead and move on to testimony. Uh, no one in the room to testify. I'm gonna assume there's no one on Zoom as well and we'll just kick it straight over uh, to the phone lines. BPS, take it away. Thank you, Chair Harris. The public line is open and working. However, I have no callers on the line at all. Uh, if you would like to take a short pause, I can stand by. Yes, let's do that. Uh, we'll give folks just a, a minute to collect themselves. I'm sure there are plenty who'd like to opine on the fate of the Commission on Special License Plates. Thank you, Chair Harris. BPS is standing by. All right. Uh, is it still the case that there is no one on the line at all? Uh, Chair Harris, yes, that is correct. Okay, we'll go ahead and let the record reflect then that there was no, uh, no one on the line to testify uh, in support, in opposition, or in neutral. Uh, and I'll welcome you back, Assemblywoman, if you'd like to make any closing comments. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Assemblywoman Brown May, for the record, I just would like to say thank you very much for taking the time to hear this very exciting and, and publicly aware bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, we'll close the hearing on AB 188, and we will turn to our last order of business, which is public comment. BPS, do we have anyone on the line? Chair Harris, at this time, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers. All right. Uh, we will then uh, be adjourned. Thank you all uh, for your patience. We will be adjourned until uh, Wednesday, May 12th at 3.30 p.m. See you all then.